We're here at the University of Colorado's Summers Bosch Observatory. The observatory has a beautiful solar telescope. Up on the roof is a special mirror that tracks the sun across the sky. And it sends a beam of sunlight through a telescope lens off several other mirrors and makes this nice image of the sun right here. If you look closely, there's at least one sunspot. Believe it or not, that's about half the size of the planet Earth. Also, if you look more closely at the sun, you'll see that it's brighter in the middle than it is at the edge. And in a future module of this course, we're going to talk about the structure of the sun, which parts are hotter, which parts are cooler, and you can start to see that from this image. But the thing that really gives us the clues to the structure of the sun is not just the visible image, it's the spectrum. So we can adjust the solar telescope to show us the sun's spectrum. Let's take a close look at that and talk about what it immediately reveals about what the sun is like. So here's the beautiful solar spectrum. And if you look at it closely, you see that it's crossed by hundreds and hundreds of dark absorption lines. So as Kirchhoff and Bunsen taught us, we immediately know that the sun has an absorption spectrum. The sun consists of a hot, dense gas that's the interior of the sun, and then the sun's atmosphere absorbs some of that light, and it puts these dark absorption lines into the spectrum. So I can look at this, I can compare the wavelengths or colors of these lines to the ones that we saw in the laboratory here on Earth, and I can identify all the different elements in the sun. If we put all our observations together, we can build up a picture of the whole sun. Down in the core, where the gas pressure is the highest and the temperature and densities are the hottest, are the nuclear reactions that power the sun. Energy comes out through the body of the sun. In about the outer one-third of the sun, the material actually begins to convect. The hot gas rises, cools off near the visible surface of the sun, and sinks back down and goes round and round and round. The visible surface of the sun is called the photosphere. If you just take, say, a very, very dark filter and look at the sun, as you may do on eclipse day, you'll see the visible surface of the sun and maybe some sunspots. Above that is the chromosphere and corona that you can only see during a total eclipse. The chromosphere gives off ultraviolet light. The corona gives off x-rays because the gas is so hot. Remember our black body demonstration or our graph of how much light comes out at the different wavelengths. The hotter an object is, the more high energy light it emits. This is the sun seen with a telescope that detects ultraviolet light. But this hot ultraviolet light means that there's gas on the sun much hotter than the 6,000 degrees of the photosphere or the sun's visible surface. Here is the sun seen by a telescope that detects X-ray light. And you can see that there are X-rays, lots of them, coming out of the sun. And to have enough energy to make X-rays, the gas must be something like a million degrees. So this is quite a puzzle. Here we are far above the visible surface of the sun farther from the sun's core, from the source of the energy, and yet the gas is even hotter. How can that be? A good analogy, believe it or not, uh, is a whip. Now, I don't know how much attention you've paid to whips in your life, but if you did pay attention to a whip, you'd hear the crack of a whip, and you might be surprised to learn that the crack of a whip is the tip of the whip breaking the sound barrier. How in the world can it be that you can make something go a thousand miles an hour? The trick is, if you look at the handle of a whip, it's big and substantial. If you look at the tip of a whip, it's very thin. The energy that you put into the handle travels along the whip, and when it gets to the tip, all of that energy is deposited into a relatively small amount of mass. So the atoms in the tip of the whip can move really, really fast because there's not too many atoms there and they're getting all of that energy. And the same thing happens in the sun's corona. 
The corona way out far from the sun is not very dense. And so when the energy from lower down reaches the sun's corona, those few atoms get all the energy and they move very, very fast and they heat up to temperatures that emit x-rays. The sun isn't a whip, obviously. The sun's atmosphere is a gas. And so how does energy transfer upwards through a gas? That puzzled astronomers for many, many decades until we discovered the answer is magnetism. Here is a close-up view of the surface of the sun, and the dark line you see in the center is actually the slit letting light into a spectroscope through a diffraction grating. So what does the spectrum of the surface of the sun look like? Well, this is the part of the sun where there was a sunspot, and you see that the spectrum line is split into three little spectrum lines where the sunspot is. What causes such a splitting? A magnetic field. Remember that when we looked at an atom, an electron was going round and round, and an electron is charged. In a magnetic field, depending on if the field is, so to speak, north or south relative to the electron, it can give it a little more or a little less energy. And so instead of a pure spectrum line, you get a little bit extra red, a little bit extra blue because there's a magnetic field there. So every sunspot has a strong magnetic field. And since the gases on the sun are ionized or charged, the electrons are typically separate from the atom. So you have negative electrons, positive protons. The magnetic field can make them bend. And a magnetic field is making the gas bend. And the same thing happens on our sun. So if you are fortunate enough to see the total eclipse, of August 2017, this is approximately what the sun's corona will look like. And all of this structure in the sun's corona is provided by the magnetic fields. The whole area around a sunspot is where the magnetic field of the sun is especially strong. Now the magnetic field inhibits the motion of the gases and it causes them to be cooler because of that and they look dark compared to the rest of the sun because they're cooler in the sunspot where the magnetic field is strong. They're cooler there than the immediately surrounding photosphere or visible surface of the sun. Take a look at this video and notice in the video how the gases of the sunspot region move less than the surrounding gas. The 11-year sunspot cycle that our friend, the pharmacist Heinrich Schwabe, discovered is actually a magnetic and solar activity cycle. The hot gas, prominences that are loops of hot gas above the sun's surface, eruptions or solar flares, all of this activity follows this magnetic cycle of about 11 years. Let's take a look at the sun filmed with a telescope that just detects x-rays. Sometimes the sun has big eruptions. Uh, when material is shot into the corona and out into space, we call it a coronal mass ejection. And in this video, you can see a constant solar wind, and you can see individual coronal mass ejection events. The particles that shoot off the sun into space are called the solar wind. Since the sun is mostly made of hydrogen, the solar wind is mostly hydrogen. But the sun is hot enough that the hydrogen is actually ionized. So instead of going around in the orbitals in the atoms, the electrons come free. So the part of the solar wind that goes through space and gets close to the Earth is actually then deflected by our magnetic field and it comes down on the Earth near the North and South Poles. One result of the solar wind is the beautiful aurora, or northern and southern lights. And we realize now that the source of the northern lights is the solar wind. Unfortunately, the solar wind can also interfere with satellites. It can, uh, in extreme cases, interfere with the electrical grid here on the Earth. That's the reason that astronomers at the Space Environment Center in Boulder, Colorado, 
24 hours a day, keep a close watch on the sun. Particles from the sun take a day or a couple of days to reach the earth, whereas the light from some big eruption only takes eight minutes. And so we have some warning, and it's possible to warn the people who operate satellites and operate the electrical grid that the worst effects of a major solar storm are on their way to the earth.